there's not a single physicalist, functionalist, or illusionist theory that can explain any one specific conscious experience. Modern science and science for the last several centuries has assumed that uh, space and time are fundamental uh, under Newton. And then uh, since Einstein, their combination in to the union of space-time. And that is space-time and its objects has been for the last century and actually for, for several centuries, the fundamental notion of reality that we've seen in, 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 and assumed in science. But recently, physicists, high-energy theoretical particle physicists, have discovered that space-time is doomed. It's not fundamental. And they're looking beyond. So Nathan Seiberg at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton says, I'm almost certain that space and time are illusions. These are primitive notions that will be replaced by something more sophisticated. Ed Witten at the Institute for Advanced Study says, space and time may be doomed. Andrew Strominger at Harvard, Harvard says the notion of space-time is clearly something we're going to have to give up. And Nima Arkani Hamed at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton says the very notion of space-time is not a fundamental one. Space-time is doomed. There is no such thing as space-time fundamentally in the actual underlying description of the laws of physics. David Gross, winner of the Nobel Prize, uh, in physics says there is no operational meaning to distances smaller than the Planck length. And that's one critical reason why space-time is doomed. Um, it has no operational meaning to distances smaller than the Planck length. And to understand that, suppose that we want to measure something that's very, very tiny. To measure something with that's tinier and tinier, we need to use uh, light or radiation with smaller and smaller wavelengths. And and that's fine. Um, but as you use smaller and smaller wavelengths, the energy goes up. And if you have unbounded energy, that's problem. no problem. You can go smaller and smaller. But the problem is that when you get Einstein's space, time, and gravity involved, then when you get so much energy packed into such a small volume of space, um, the mass energy density is so high that you create a black hole and you destroy the very object that you're trying to observe. So I'm trying to see some small object by the time I'm trying to, I get down to the Planck scale, um, the, the very attempt to see the object destroys the fabric of space-time. So there's no operational meaning to space-time below the Planck scale. It just fa it fails to have any operational meaning. So physicists are looking for a, a deeper framework. And what this means is that reductionism ultimately is also doomed. Reductionism is the view that um, as we go to smaller and smaller scales in space, that we find um, more and more fundamental entities and more and more fundamental laws that govern the interactions of those entities. And what this is saying is that that process may work for a while, but it, it, it falls apart by the time you get to the Planck scale. And the Planck scale is, you know, some people might say that's pretty deep, but it's only 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And it's not 10 to the minus 33 trillion centimeters, just 10 to the minus 33. So in some sense, space-time is a shallow data structure. But so reductionism is also doomed, as, as Nima Arkani Hamed puts it. So the entire reductionist paradigm that fundamentally physics is given by some laws at the ultra most microscopic distance scales, and that somehow we just have to go there to see what's going on, is ultimately false because of gravity. So what's nice about our, our theory of space-time is that our theory of space-time itself tells us where that theory ends. Our laws tell us the scope and limits of the very concept of space-time. Now, in the standard reductionist view, in, in some sense, you know, the most elementary particles are the, the, the bosons, leptons, and quarks of the standard model of physics. Um, and in that reductionist view, um, complex combinations of those particles give rise to more macroscopic um, objects, such as these pyramidal neurons, and they give rise to even more macroscopic objects, such as brains. And then uh, studies of consciousness, for example, then assume um, a reductionist framework. Most of my colleagues um, who are studying consciousness will, will say that the brain 
um, and neural networks and their and their properties and their their processing somehow creates our conscious experiences. So it comes most of the work on consciousness is in a reductionist framework. Global workspace theory, for example, says that there's some kind of working memory that uh, somehow gives rise to, to consciousness, a so working architecture, working memory architecture. Integrated information theory uh, that says if you have the right kind of causal structure um, of integration of information that you will somehow, um, that, that is consciousness or, or creates consciousness. Or the orchestrated collapse of uh, quantum states of neuronal microtubules and uh, Hameroff and Penrose's theories. Or illusionism. So in each of these cases, the, each theory assumes that particles are fundamental, that particles give rise ultimately to macroscopic objects like brains, and that brains give rise to consciousness um, or to the illusion of consciousness. So Keith Frankish and Dan Dennett, for example, Michael Graziano might say that we don't really have conscious experiences, we only have the illusion of conscious experiences. And it's real, all that is really real is just the neural activity. Now, so that's, I would say 99% of my colleagues studying consciousness are, are, are physicalists of some kind or, or functionalists of some kind, as I've just described, or illusionists. But what's remarkable about this work is that if you ask, okay, well, great. So I'm interested in conscious experiences and a scientific theory of conscious experiences. So can you give me um, the integrated information theory account for the taste of chocolate. What what pattern of uh, causal architecture must be the taste of chocolate and couldn't be, you know, the taste of vanilla? Or, you know, what global workspace architecture must be the sound of you know, saxophone and couldn't be the sound of a clarinet? Uh, or what orchestrated collapse of neuronal microtubule quantum states must be the smell of a rose and couldn't be the smell of a lemon? And what's remarkable is something that Steven Pinker has pointed out in the case of the global workspace that I call the stipulation problem of consciousness. But what Pinker points out in the case of global workspace is that it's a wonderful theory. He likes the theory, but he says the last dollop in the theory, that it subjectively feels like something to be such circuitry, may have to be stipulated as a fact about reality where explanation stops. And this is true of all the theories. There's not a single physicalist, functionalist, or illusionist theory that can explain any one specific conscious experience. We're batting zero. So there's there's no, no theory that can give us one conscious experience as, as coming out and being explained by the theories. And that's, that's quite remarkable. So every experience has to be stipulated, and, and we have millions and millions of experiences, so that's millions of stipulations that are required. So we have the assumption of space and time and physical properties of neurons and so forth, and then we have to stipulate the conscious experiences as well, or stipulate the illusion of conscious experiences. And the illusionists also have to explain the, the illusion, why is this pattern of brain activity, the illusion of chocolate and, and couldn't be the illusion of vanilla. So they don't get off easy on this one either. So space-time is doomed, reductionism is doomed, and the physicists, though, are, aren't, you know, throwing in the towel and saying, oh, oy vey, we, you know, we can't do this. No, this is, you know, the, the new generation is quite happy. Let's, let's, let's go beyond space-time. Let's look at physics beyond space-time and also physics beyond quantum theory. Um, so as, as, for example, Nima Arkani Hamed, says, so there's some other structure that we're looking for, and some way of thinking about interpreting this structure that will let us see space-time and quantum mechanics emerge simultaneously and joined at the hip. So this is sort of the, the project in high-energy theoretical particle physics for, for many researchers, is space-time has been a good framework, but it's over. So space-time and its objects are not fundamental reality. It's 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 um, it was a useful framework, but that's it, but it's over. And now we're looking for something beyond space time and quantum mechanics that will give rise to space time and quantum mechanics. And we're looking for structures and ideas that don't look like anything having to do with particles propagating in space time and wave functions involving in Hilbert space. Again, space and time and quantum theory are not fundamental. And what they're doing is they're they're looking at um, trying to explain data from particle scattering experiments at, at colliders like the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.